Hello, welcome to the TED interview. I'm Chris Anderson, and today's guest is different. How can I put this? Jacqueline, hello. Hi, Chris. How's your day going? Like, this is a really unique guest. Well, it's an interesting day because I get to see you in the middle of it. That doesn't normally happen. We work in the same house. Um, we're busy. You especially. You work absolutely crazy hours. <laughs> um, she's um, she's the woman I'm married to. What time did you wake up this morning? That's so unfair. Um, last <laughs> night was a particularly bad night, so I got up at one. <laughs> More typical, I would say, is four. But five and six, that would be like a super late sleeping few. <laughs> But she's not on this podcast because I'm married to her. She's on this podcast because she is truly one of the world's great change makers. In fact, that's why I spent four years begging her to marry me. Her name is Jacqueline Novogratz. But beyond the money that she and Acumen have invested and the millions of lives they've touched, what we're going to focus on in this conversation are some things that are even deeper and are certainly more broadly applicable. Insights Jacqueline has spent decades learning. They are about what it takes, what it really takes, to devote a life to making change. I think it's true to say that today, more and more people have realized that the traditional measures of success just aren't that fundamentally satisfying. People would like to do something more meaningful with their lives. But how? It's not easy but it is doable. And that is what we're going to talk about. I have seen Jacqueline operating up close for many years now. And I, I've just become convinced that the wisdom she's gained is truly special. So if you're actually open to truly imagining how you might spend the next few years of your life, I think you may find this conversation pretty remarkable, and possibly even a little dangerous. Here is the amazing Jacqueline Novogratz. It's not an accident that you're on this season of the Turn interview, you know, where we've got this theme, the case for optimism, talking to people who I think can help make that case. And certainly whenever I'm gloomy about the world, when I think about what you do and what you have achieved, um, it kind of cheers me up. And here's, here's how I'd, I'd frame that. It's not just that you've, you've spent more like 35 years um, in the trenches battling poverty, one of the world's obviously the hardest problems. It's that somehow in the process, you have built around you this extraordinary world of young, youngish, mostly young people who, who are helping you, you know, on this mission. And they're all working for something bigger than they are. And just when you meet them, it is just the most inspiring thing. So let's make the assumption that a lot of people listening to this, in principle, would love to contribute more to the world, to make things change, change the world, whatever language you want to use. And the, the core focus, I think, of our conversation is, what does it take to turn that into reality? Spoiler alert, it's not a easy. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot and none of it is easy. Before we dig into the details of that, though, I think people would be really interested to hear a bit of your story. I, I, I certainly love hearing it. So why don't we start there? Tell us about you. As you know, Chris, I'm the eldest of seven in a military family that moved around the United States. And so pretty middle class background in the United States, growing up in suburbia. And yet I always had these dreams of knowing the world, loving the world, maybe because my dad was in Vietnam for three different tours. And I would imagine people on the other side of the world. And then because of our family, if you were going to go to college, you had to find a way to pay for it. And so during university, I worked nonstop. And at the end of university, I told my parents that I didn't want to just get a job, that I wanted to actually take a year and do what so many of my friends did, which was enjoy life at that moment. And my parents being very wise said, we think that's a great idea, but promise us that at least you'll go through the interview process. So I did. And I dutifully got my one suit and put my resume into the boxes for my major foreign affairs and economics. And I got an interview with Chase Manhattan Bank. 
never in my life had I thought about being a banker, but I was doing the interview thing. And so I walk in, there's a cute guy sitting on the other side of the table. And he says, Miss Novogratz, tell me, why do you want to be a banker? And of course, it was the only question that I was completely unprepared for. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, truth is, I don't, I don't want to be a banker. My parents are making me do this. And um, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he said, um, well, too bad, because if you got this job, you would be in 40 countries over the next three years learning about the economic and political situation in these nations. And I was like, oh, man, this is all I ever wanted to do. And so I said, could you think that we could um, start this interview over? So I left the room. I knocked on the door. I reintroduced myself. I sat down. He said, Mr. Nevergast, tell me, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. <laughs> and, um, and I guess, Chris, that started me off, an accidental banker that then saw the power of banking and also its limitations. So tell me about that, because you did indeed travel. You spent time in 40 Britain, countries. And something started to bug you. Yeah. I mean, I loved the tools. I loved how numbers could tell a story. I loved math. And what I didn't love was that the poor had no place in the banks. They weren't welcomed in the doors of the banks. And so I'd see all this vitality in the favelas of Brazil and on the streets and in, in an exclusion of the poor. And so that sent me off, as you know, through a long story, but I ended up in Kigali, Rwanda, and I co-founded the nation's first microfinance bank with this idea that you could take the tools of banking and offer it to very low income people. And so this bank actually got set up. Um, this was Rwanda pre-genocide. And um, you worked with a group of founders there and, and kind of pulled off some kind of miracle to get this bank set up. Well, it was very much pre-genocide. And the moment, 1986, was such an important moment because it was the first time in Rwandan history where women could open a bank account without their husband's signature. And so all of a sudden, there was a financial opportunity for women that had never existed before. And at the same time, Rwanda at that time, and I guess still today, was full of various nonprofit efforts, various charities and aid organizations trying to do their thing. You had a sort of front seat exposure to what worked and an awful lot of what didn't work. Talk a bit about some things you noticed about how well-intentioned efforts to change the world really weren't cutting it. Yeah. If banking taught me that markets have such an important place, but to often exclude the poor and sometimes exploit them, development, top-down particularly, aids, grants, traditional charity, to often create dependency. I saw it in a million ways. I applied for this grant and the application asked me to talk about the number of people we would impact, et cetera, et cetera. And so I marched myself into this woman's office and I said, you know, I could lie to you and tell you that we're having these workshops and all we have to do is count the number of women who walk down the street and it counts for aid, but you don't have any boxes that are asking me about what it actually takes to get a woman a job, help her succeed in that job, gain more income. And she laughed and said, I don't, so why don't you lie? Which I never could do as evidenced by my first interview. I would go and see projects for housing and all the money would be spent on the housing foundation. And there was no thought of capability building again. And the houses would have walls that were like six inches high or schools where really well-intended people wanted to adopt schools, build schools with no thought of what it took to actually hire capable teachers and build the infrastructure so those schools could operate. And there seemed to be a lack of listening to poor people as real agents in their lives. And instead, this decision that, that we had to do for low-income people in ways that almost incapacitated rather than developed their own human capabilities. And that seemed a tragedy to me. And that dependency... It took away something, which I've heard you talk about so much, that is so important to you. Dignity. What is dignity and why does it matter? My time in Rwanda taught me that the opposite of poverty isn't income. The opposite of poverty is dignity. It's choice. It's opportunity. It's the freedom to make decisions about your own lives. And that was what was too often stripped, both by exclusionary markets and by top-down development 
that if we really wanted to solve problems of poverty, first of all, we had to define poverty as that lack of choice, lack of opportunity. And then we could use the tools of aid, use the tools of the market, but pull in our own accountability from a a place that insisted on enabling people to participate so that they could contribute to things that are bigger than themselves, ultimately. So rolling the clock forward a few years, around about the turn of the millennium, you were dreaming of trying to build something that avoided, you know, what was wrong with banking and what was wrong with traditional charity. You wanted a different kind of model and you created Acumen. What was the, what was the vision there? I turned everything on its head and thought, if we were trying to solve tough problems of poverty, how might we do that differently? And at the center of that were two things. One, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are seekers by definition. And uh, in 2000, at the end of the last century, there was a growing group of what we call social entrepreneurs who were building businesses, but rather than seeking profit at the center, were trying to solve big, hairy problems like energy and healthcare and education and agriculture. And two, if we could take philanthropy and rather than give it away, invest long-term, and I'm talking 10 to 15 years long-term, in those entrepreneurs. And we accompanied them with our social capital, our access to networks and corporate supply chains, that we could help these entrepreneurs solve the big problems of poverty. And so we were off to the races. So give me an example of how a company is actually helping the poor. Because for a lot of people, they, they, they put companies and the poor in sort of enemies almost. The companies are there to exploit the poor, and perhaps they often are. But what does it look like when a company can make life better for the poor? So one of the best examples in Acumen's portfolio is a company called Delight. Back in 2006, 0.5 billion people in the world relied on dirty, expensive, dangerous kerosene to put in the old-fashioned hurricane lamps for their light and in some cases for their heating. And uh, these two young guys, Sam Goldman and Ned Tozen, came into our offices with a $30 solar light and said that they were going to eradicate kerosene from the planet. All they had was their light. We took a bet on them. And what excited us about Sam and Ned is that they saw low-income people as customers. They didn't see them as passive recipients of charity, nor did they see them as the kerosene mafias, extortionary holders of the kerosene, saw them as people to exploit. And so they had to listen to their customers, build from their perspective. And now remember, these are customers who make two, three to four dollars a day. They were living in places with no financing, no trust, no infrastructure, but a lot of bureaucracy, complacency, corruption. And they had to find a way to deliver something affordable, accessible, and valued Mm. by low-income people, again, as trusted customers. And if they could do so, they, and we reasoned, we might actually make a dent in solving the electricity problem. And sure enough, it hasn't been easy for anybody, but D-Light has now brought over 100 million low-income people light and increasingly electricity. So let's dig into this a bit more because it's um, someone might say, well, that's, that's just what companies hmm. do. That's a company with a good product. What are you doing that's any different from what any venture capitalist would do? The venture capitalists invest in entrepreneurs. They start companies and then, well, you know, changes as that company scales. But in this case, the point was, I guess, that from the point of view of a traditional VC, this was a really bad business plan. There was no prospect of financial return anytime soon, because you're talking about a product being sold to people who have very little money and who live in really difficult circumstances, really hard to distribute to. You know, this was going to take years to do. And so to have any chance of doing it, you had to, the term you use is patient capital. It needs not regular investment capital, but patient capital to give something like this a chance. Is that, is that the, the core of it? When we first made the investment, um, and I was so proudly 
describing it to a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. He said, so what I'm hearing is that you're going to subsidize this company and these entrepreneurs with this long-term capital. And I don't believe in subsidies because it's distortionary and you're just distorting markets. And I don't think I fully understood my answer to him then, but it was the right answer, which is that what are we distorting? There is no market. We are actually taking a bet on two entrepreneurs to create a market that has never existed for people who frankly have never counted. And we are in, not as investors alone, but as partners. And so number one, a 10 to 15 year trajectory. Number two, being driven by investment as a means, not as the end in and of itself. So when things got bad, and for the first five to seven years, things got bad. (laughs) We didn't pull out, nor did we double down blindly. But we recognized in Sam and Ned that we had the right entrepreneurs and that we saw a trajectory to success. But we had to not only put in more investment capital, but help them raise grant funding and create other kinds of partnerships so that they could succeed. So it's as if you took, okay, let's start with traditional startup capitalism, (laughs) for want of a better term, Um, but make two important tweaks. One, look for entrepreneurs who are in it for more than just making a quick buck. They really, they really- They want to solve a problem. They want to solve a problem. And two, be willing to support them in, in a ways to a greater extent for a longer time period with more patience, with more support than a traditional investor could normally be able to justify doing. Yeah. And at the end of the day for Acumen to measure our returns on a social impact basis, not simply a financial basis. Right. Right. The purpose is not just to get a 15% internal return or whatever. It's to improve lives. And that, that those are the metrics that you care most about. And where I stand now, Chris, is that Just as we have to reimagine capitalism, so must we also reimagine investing. That real investing has to be defined by the amount of energy you release, by the amount of beauty you built, by the amount of good you do. Mm. And that real investing should take into consideration in a negative way the amount of environmental damage you create, the amount of jobs you destroy in the name of shareholder profit. And that's a conversation that we haven't had Um, because we got drawn into capitalism raised to the rank of religion as ideology. And now we have an opportunity to have a very different conversation because we've seen the power of capitalism and we've also seen its weaknesses, its limitations. And that's why I'm hopeful because I think this is a moment for that reimagination. So so the big picture is you've been doing this for 35 years and you've learned stuff. And uh, a year ago, you published a book. I think you described it as a love letter to the next generation. This book is called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. And I I want to dig into some of it because there are so many people out there that their start point right now is, yes, I would love to make a difference. What does it take? So share some of the lessons that are in that book and in your mind and in that thinking. What does it take? Um. Probably the most important of the 13 practices is the moral imagination. Cultivate moral imagination. And by moral imagination, I mean the ability to see the world as it is. And that requires great humility and the audacity of imagining what it could be. What I mean by that and what the practices are that enable that are to start with empathy. You see a person who's suffering. You see a situation you want to change. But if all you have is empathy and you stop right there, you've essentially reinforced the status quo. Empathy must catalyze immersion. From empathy, get close. Understand a community's problems, what holds them back. And also be honest about where people might be getting in their own way. From there, really looking at that system and taking action. So the moral imagination can apply to many different sectors and many different ways of building, but it's an unvarnished view of the miserable state that is while holding to the optimism and holding to the idea of what the world can be and then building a plan to get there. 
this is not just for the, the young person who wants to change the world. As corporations think about their strategies and how to make them more inclusive, moral imagination is a departure from simple imagination because so many of us use the lens only of our own imagination. But when you're designing for people who's, whose lives are unlike our own, whether across race or class or caste or religion, it's important to understand the reality of those people and then build solutions from that perspective. And that's really where the moral imagination starts. What is moral? What does it mean? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean a set of rules prescribed from some higher authority. It does not mean righteousness. It's actually the opposite. Moral is based in a framework that recognizes our interdependency, that we are connected not only to every human being, but to every living thing. And that's really at the heart of the, the whole moral revolution idea, that our job in this generation and the next is to reimagine our economic system, our whole economy, and move from putting profit and the individual at the center of everything to systems that put our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth there. If you build from that framework, that will drive you, including the poor and vulnerable, and sustaining the earth. So fundamentally, moral is it's the inclination to give rather than take. Yeah, if there's one golden rule, it's give more to the world than you take. For for an investor like Acumen, we have a radical idea that we want to invest more than we extract. Right. But there's, you know, in business, there's, of course, this this, um, seductive idea that was very prominent in the 80s and is still prominent, which is that, no, 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 the whole genius of capitalism is that it could convert self-interest into public good. Um, and and that there's a sort of simplicity to that world where if you just if you just build companies that are in investors and interests and so forth, that that will create this money making machine that will eventually cycle products down that will get distributed to everyone. And that there is some some truth in the let's not say greed is good, but let's say that greed can be processed by capitalism into surprisingly good things like. Amazing companies get built and extraordinary products get built, probably largely motivated out of greed. And it often does work quite well. But your conviction and your experience is that that doesn't take you far enough, that that's going to end up excluding so many people. Well, sure. I mean, it goes to the, the moral imagination as well as it's not saying that all humans are good. All humans should be good all the time. It more recognizes what human beings are. And that we're all a mix of greed and generosity. Adam Smith came upon an an extraordinary insight in looking at self-interest as a driver for change, ambition, the desire to be uh, seen. And he also wrote the theory of moral sentiments, which was how we curb those desires, how we match it with generosity. And we've gone out of kilter that, Mm. you know, when I worked in Rwanda, it was right before the Berlin Wall fell. And 40% of the world was in poverty, 40% in extreme poverty. And so opening the world to markets has lifted billions of people out of poverty. Less than 10% of the world is now in extreme poverty. That's a massive achievement. And yet with unbridled capitalism and a conceit that greed is good, We also have a level of wholly unsustainable inequality, more divisiveness than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And we are, as a world, facing cataclysmic climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's not good for any of us. And so it's about holding the recognition that inside all of us are competing forces. And if we held ourselves to that single metric of at the end of the day, I want to give more than I take, that would change everything. So talk about how moral imagination worked in the case of Delight. Well, Sam laughs because he didn't have the imagination. Of, it's so easy to be the frog in the water. Um, he worked for five years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Benin in West Africa in an unelectrified village. And the only light he had besides his own kerosene lamp 
was one of those little lights you put on your forehead from campers. <laughs> and he just assumed that's the way it was. And then, as you said, one night, his neighbor's kerosene lantern fell over and almost burned down the house and almost killed his son. And that was the moment Sam thought, no, it cannot be that a fifth of the world lives in darkness 140 years after Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And that was the beginning of his moral imagination. Then he went to business school and he met Ned Tozum, who brought an engineering background and they started to develop what they thought was the solution. It wasn't until then they immersed and they went to build in the villages that they wanted to support, starting in India. And they began to understand from people what they valued, what they didn't value. And then they realized they had no financing mechanism. And mm-hmm. they started with microfinance. It was sort of clumsy in many countries to put all those pieces together. And it was in 2011 when uh, mobile banking in Kenya came onto the scene that they were able to combine their solar technology with mobile banking. So now, again, seeing the world as it is, Mm -hmm. they could meet people where they were, but it happened because they had the moral imagination to listen, to immerse, to um, understand all parts of the systems and then build it. Okay, so that's that's one key element. What's what's another key element to make change real? Holding opposing values or truths in tension, and to recognize that building anything is a constant trade-off between generosity and accountability, between profit and purpose, and those builders who who are infused with the moral imagination get good with being super uncomfortable and holding those. So quick example, Javad Aslam, who built the first affordable housing development for low-income people in Pakistan, started off with all of this great idealism. Of course, met with having to not pay bribes and, the, and what that meant. So it, you know, it took him three, four years just to get the houses up and running. And then, of course, the customers started testing Javad by not paying, assuming he was some big institution. And so there he is confronted. Here I am, a a person who's now left my country, moved to another place, immersed myself. He lived in the the development and did what I thought was, quote unquote, a good thing for people. And they're not paying. But can I really evict the poor that I've just put into housing? And ultimately, he had to navigate those tensions between being generous and also holding people accountable. And he has this great story where he hired an Acumen fellow, um, young guy who'd come from Silicon Valley his first week in Pakistan. And he thinks he's changing the world. And then, and Javad says, you know, welcome to AMC, get in the truck. We're going to go evict a few people. (laughs) And the guy's like, wait a minute. I, I left Apple so that I could do good. And Javad knew what he was doing. And they went to the first house and they padlocked the door. And within five minutes, neighbors came running up with the cash to pay for that month. And then the real conversation happened. But had he not made that move, he wouldn't have succeeded. And since then, he's sold half his company and is a huge success and is taking the model across the nation. Mm. So it's... (laughs) <laughs> doing good, there are moments when you have to be super tough. You have to do what looks harsh to outsiders who may not be aware of what it takes to actually build something in real world conditions. Absolutely. And I actually think it's a form of respect to people sometimes say, you know, you get on these stages and you talk about love, but then you're really tough in the negotiating room. And what I've come to realize, Chris, is that real love is not easy. We could tell a whole personal story about going through the hardest things in life or are those times when you're doing the most difficult work to show up, to have the hard conversation. And that requires an embrace of nuance and it requires a touchstone to that North Star again. I am here not to make everybody like me, I am here because I want to build something that is fundamentally going to change the system so that low-income people long after me 
are mm. going to be able to change their own lives. And this feels different from how we sometimes think about change makers. We you know we think of the idealist who who won't compromise. They they have a very clear north star. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. If you, you know, get out of my way, I'm doing this. And and I guess what I hear you saying is, well, that's lovely. That's wonderful. Good, good luck. But to <laughs> to actually make change at scale. You are not guaranteed sort of moral purity that the sort of the, I was going to say the smug comfort of moral purity your whole life. You may have to be uncomfortable. And and what is the difference between embracing the discomfort of contradictory positions and letting go of your North Star and of your true values? So there are non-negotiables. We've never paid a bribe. And when we see corruption in a company, and we have, we exit the company. Here's the other side of the story nobody talks about, which is where you have to be clear and focused, is that doing the right thing also comes with a price. And it's not an easy price often. One of my favorite Fragments of poetry is by Rilke, where he says, so many are raised to the rank of prince by the slippery ease of their light judgment. Say that again. That's so powerful. So many are raised to the rank of prince by the slippery ease of their light judgment. But you love people who do work and feel thirst. I don't know why I'm getting emotional. But um, I think that that's also part of the change maker's life. If you are committed to serving people whose lives are different from your own, who have been excluded, you are by definition working in a lot of ugly markets. Mm -hmm. You want corrupt markets? Go work in healthcare, housing, water, energy. And so you've got to know who you are and the decisions that you will make on that pursuit. But then As you said, Chris, it may mean partnering with people who make you uncomfortable, partnering where there is values alignment and there's a lot of difference. And I wish there were a textbook way of articulating when to say yes and when to say no, because you're going to make mistakes as well. And that goes back to the humility and strength of knowing why you're in the game and building the, the sense of resilience to keep yourself there. Mm. Jacqueline, what would you say is the hardest part of this work? Quite frankly, Chris, it's, it's dealing with the complacency of too many people around us. We're at a moment in history where we can see the problems. We know the solutions. In the United States, we understand the inequities in our systems. And yet... We're not moving fast enough. We're talking. When I started, it's easy to say that we were looking for people that were willing to reject the status quo. What you don't understand when you hear that until you're actually doing the work is that the status quo isn't just big, bad corporations. It's not big, bad, corrupt government officials. It's the whole system because the system in a way works for anyone who has a slightly vested interest in it. You go into a slum, it's the moneylenders, it's the religious leaders, it's the, obviously the politicians and the slum lords. 
that you can't go in with this naivete that you're going to have a great solution and the world is just going to take it up, but that you are going to have to recognize and confront the various actors, find ways to either align them or to beat them and move forward. Mm. I mean, is it fair to say that one of the areas where a lot of people will feel this today, especially, is is in what attitude you have towards business in general. Like so many people now are sort of um, uh, 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 sick of business, of capitalism. Um, it's failed us. It's evil. They don't want anything to do with it. What, what What's your advice to someone who wants to make change at scale? Is that a viable stance? What, what would you say to them? I would say, number one, we are the system. We get to make the system. And number two, what we lose sight of so often is that what we're talking about are tools, but we've lifted these tools to the end in and of themselves. Business is a tool. We get to decide its purpose and we got to decide how to run it. We have to, as a culture, move from seeing the purpose of business is making profit to seeing the purpose of business is serving society, period. Once you move to that second purpose, it's not that the shareholders won't get financial gains over time, but they will be shared with other stakeholders. And so what excites me is that I get to work with these entrepreneurs, Chris, as you know, across the whole world, including in the United States, that are hell-bent on solving problems where both markets and government have failed the poor. And the most interesting ones are redefining business even as they operate. So I think of Every Table, a company that wanted to confront the food deserts across the United States. So Every Table started by a guy named Sam Polk, built an affordable, nutritious, healthy, fast food restaurant, grew it to eight restaurants. First day of the pandemic, Sam, driven by his North Star, sends a tweet out that says, if you need food, we'll get it to you. If you can't pay, we'll get it to you anyway. If you're willing to pay it forward, click here. A few weeks in, they had delivered like 100,000 meals. Hmm. Then they partnered with government to deliver food to homeless shelters and to really hard hit communities. So by now, they've reached over 4 million people. As they were growing in the midst of this pandemic, they realized they had an opportunity to build out new franchises. And that when you look at who runs franchises in the United States, black and brown people have been left out and that they had this very amazing employee base. And so they are raising a fund for like 2% interest that will then be on lent to the employees that show real entrepreneurial capabilities, but they'll ensure that people get paid $40,000 a year for three years to give them a running start. And they intend to have 40 new franchises up and running in the next two years, all run by former employees, now partners who who are black and brown and who've lived in disadvantaged communities. We get to choose the way that we reimagine and reconstruct capitalism. And I think this moment of history has awakened us to seeing more opportunities for doing that and using business as an entry point into more opportunity but it doesn't just happen. We have to change the rules of business. There's another uh, key term you talk about in your book, accompaniment. What is that? So accompaniment is a Jesuit term. It essentially means to walk beside. Accompaniment is taking on another person's problem, but not solving it for them, helping them build the muscles to solve it themselves. And one of the things I've learned along the last 20 years with Acumen is that access to markets is not enough. Opportunity is not enough. What's required is often to help people who've been excluded from markets to build the capabilities so that once they're in it, they can participate. And so when Acumen first started 
investing, we looked more like a traditional private equity investor and we would make the investment and then we would monitor, see, you know, our post-investment, how are we doing? And it was only when we realized that we had to be partners that we could actually help grow the companies. Yesterday, I talked to Carlos um, Velasquez, who is a Colombian chocolate entrepreneur, and he works with indigenous and post-conflict communities across Colombia. Again, areas with very little trust and, and very limited skills in some of the more conventional senses, although they had their own sets of skills. And Carlos and, and his team accompanied the, the communities that they were serving so that they could actually grow and collect the best cacao that goes into the, the best chocolate in the world. We then could accompany Cacao de Colombia in ways that would bring in guys like Seth Godin to help them with their marketing and connecting them to other corporations across Colombia and elsewhere. And together, in accompanying each other, could build a company that just last week got awarded the best small batch chocolate in the world. <laughs> and, and I think that that's something we don't do enough of. And again, in every country right now, with the inequality, we need more in a co- accompaniment. So what I'm hearing is, from the point of view of, a, of a, someone who wants to make change, you can almost think about accompaniment in two ways. One, for the people you want to make a difference to, don't just have like a transactional relationship with them. You need to be alongside them. You need to be understanding them at a much deeper level and, and understanding that they're, they're, they're real needs. But then, in addition, you yourself likely may need someone to accompany you. It's hard to do this on your own. It's a form of, in viewed that way, it sounds like it's almost like a form of mentoring and support that you've been able to offer some entrepreneurs and that would you encourage anyone who wants to make a difference to find those people who can be there with them on this journey? Absolutely, Chris. The work is too hard to do alone. And these operational and moral decisions can be too excruciating. And so one of the most powerful ways of building your own resilience is to see yourself as part of a cohort. It's one of the reasons that we started Acumen Academy to identify young potential leaders across the world and give them the skills, the tools, and importantly, the community so that they understood that they were part of a bigger community of builders, all of whom were focused on things bigger than themselves. So Acumen Academy is, is trying to build leaders of a certain kind. Of, how would you define it? Acumen Academy is the world school for social change. It's a reimagined university that is focused on building character as well as competence and enabling finding those individuals who see themselves as builders and linking them, inspiring them, educating them, connecting them. Okay, so change the world is not something you do solo. You need you need a cohort. I mean, I can ask you the same question as an entrepreneur. I've never met anyone who has done something big by themselves. Yeah, but you're more socially connected than I am. Oh, um, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's. I think it's a powerful term, and I. I wish I was. I wish I was better at it. Actually, like I don't think I mentor people very well. And, um, and I, I think there are times when I could use a compliment my, myself. So a big message of your book, I think, is that it's not like a typical sort of self-help book of, you want to do this? It's easy. Just do these seven things. One of the core messages is that this work is really hard. And yet, one of the most surprising things about the book, I think, is that you, you talk about the upside of this type of commitment to, you know, to a life lived for something bigger than you are. What, what are the upsides? The biggest upside is that there is no greater path to purpose and to meaning than to committing to something bigger than yourself. So much bigger than yourself that you might not even solve it in your lifetime. I think Again, in this moment where we all want to keep our options open, too often at the end of the day, we end up with a lot of options. 
commitment does set you free. And this kind of work sets you free to work on some of the toughest issues of our time in ways that will stretch every part of yourself. And I can't imagine a better way to live a life. That said, as you said, this work is hard and it's, it's hard for decades long, not a few years long. And many young people get it thinking, I'll do this for three years and then I'll move and I'll do something else. And 15 years later, I'm talking to them about how they're just getting started. So that mixture, I mean, this is the paradox to me. I mean, living with you and, and seeing on the one hand how, how much the work takes from you. I mean, you work crazy hours, you go through crazy stress, you're exhausted a lot of the time. There's intense you know, demands on you. And yet you're the most joyful person I know somehow. It just seems like those things shouldn't add up. And, um, and what, what I'm hearing you saying is, I mean, I think a lot of the joy comes when you most feel that you're, you're kind of being used the right way. When you're not joyful is when you think you in some way have let someone down or whatever. But even when the work is unbelievably hard, if you feel like you've been used the right way, you, you are so joyful. It is, it is amazing. And I think, I think you would say that that's, that's kind of an offer to people if they're willing to really go all in. Yeah. The older that I get, the more I realize that I want to be used up when I die. I want to, I want to give it all. And, and it's funny because people will say, you know, what are the successes you're proudest of? And, you know, sure. We've helped build companies that have helped change their nations. That's cool. Our bed net manufacturing company probably brought bed nets to half a billion people. Where I feel the deepest joy is exactly what you're saying. It's when I meet a young woman who works at Delight, the solar company, and I say, tell me your dreams. And she says, well, first, I want to electrify my village. And then I want to go to school and get a degree in marketing so I can start my own company. And because, she, because Delight decided to solve a problem, and bring electricity to the world. They've created these tens of thousands of jobs held by people who now are part of solving a problem for their country. And it just ripples and it ripples. The joy comes from that deep human connection and this, these reminders of why we're here, that we're here to do the work that we came to do. So when I hear that, um, this question almost seems uh, absurd. Like, are you optimistic? Where do you find optimism as you, as you look at the challenged world and um, the future that's coming? It's not a trite question. I almost don't even know if I understand the word optimistic, which is terrible, Chris, because you are like the biggest optimist I've ever met my whole life. Um, I think that we are at a moment in history where we truly are almost on a, on a, a jagged edge of great peril and of infinite possibility. And the choice is ours to make. And so I choose to be hopeful, almost as a daily act of faith. Mm. And, um, and so maybe if we can continue to lift role models, like some of the people I've been talking about, and say, this is what success looks like. Success looks like this. They're the people who remind me every day that there is no word like impossible when human beings are involved. Mm. We just all need to channel our moral imagination and, and go big or go home. Hmm. Well, I think right there you defined what optimism actually is. It, you know, it's, it's not a feeling that you have as a sort of you know, laid back observer of the future saying, no, no, I think things are going to be okay. Come on, May. It's, it's, a, it's a choice and it's a choice to participate. It's a choice to say, I am not with the onlookers. I'm one of the partakers. I'm in. I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to help build something that, that works. And that choice that you've made and the choices made by the people you described, I mean, that's, it's, it's inspiring to hear. And I guess where I get optimism from is the hope 
that <laughs> in the in the connected world, everything spreads in the connected world. You know, division has spread, outrage has spread, but these stories can spread as well. These stories of hope of people choosing the the hard path, but a path that is so inspiring and that makes a huge difference. And so, the more of that that I hear and see, that's that's certainly where my optimism comes from. And yeah, weirdly, a lot of it seems to come from your world. <laughs> Jacqueline, I, I ask everyone this is like the last <clears throat> question. You, you've got people listening, you've got a chance to plant one idea in their mind that you really want them to hold on to. What's that idea? In a way, Chris, you said it earlier in the conversation, give back more to the world than you take. That rather than ask, am I rich enough? Am I beautiful enough? Am I powerful enough? Every day, ask yourself, what have I done in my work, at home, at school? What have I done to give another person a little bit more dignity, help another person feel a little more beautiful, help another person on their way so that they can do financially a little better? We do that, truly, the whole system changes. Jacqueline, thanks so much for this. You know, a lot of the time I put on this act as this um, skeptical, rational, reason-driven kind of journalist guy. And I listen to you and it kind of breaks me down, honestly. It's like <laughs> I, uh, I, I discover that I, I want to be a lot more than that. And um, I feel very lucky to be married to you, to know you, and to, you know, I, I'm honestly inspired by you every day, pretty much every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, I, I'm wondering if I could just thank you for that and thank you for this conversation. And it's it's amazing to be interviewed by your husband. And so I just want to ask you a couple questions, if I may. Oh, what? <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> go on then. Uh, the this first, is not in the script. <laughs> no, it's not in the script. But it feels unfair because you know you are the biggest optimist I have ever met in my life. Um. And sometimes when I do, when I come back and I've seen so much ugly and you'll reframe, I, my first instinct is sometimes to get frustrated and then to see the power in that. But I gave you my answer for, am I hopeful? Am I optimistic? And why? What's yours, your real answer? Well, again, I would say that I don't know what the future will be at all. No one does. I'm of the view the future literally doesn't exist. It's like, like no one knows. There's not even, I don't believe there's a God out there who actually knows what the future is now. I think we're in this really complicated world and lots and lots of different things will contribute to that future, including the choices we make. But it's literally unknown now. So what are the chances that we can seize the day and actually try and make it better than it otherwise might be? And I guess where I get hope from is that there are so many ways that that could, could happen. And it's, you know, part of it comes down to human ingenuity that we are the only species on the planet that can consciously look at a problem, notice it, and say, wait a sec, what could we do about it? We can repattern things in our mind. You talk about it, it's a moral imagination. That's kind of what it is, it's a superpower that, that uh, others can't do. And so, so th I mean, the, the, the list of things that could go wrong in the future are truly terrifying. But I see lots and lots and lots of evidence of this stuff being figured out. You know, artificial intelligence could be a terrible problem for the future. It could also bring in absolute amazingness and solve so many problems. And there are great people trying to figure out the right way that it can impact. We've had this pandemic, it's been the most horrifying thing. And yet, you know, it has forced the world's attention into vaccines. Vaccines were delivered in record time using a new medical technology that can now have knock on effects for many, many other medical conditions. And we know now that if there was another terrible bug came along, possibly one engineered by some sick terrorist or lonely teenager who was genius, whatever, we'll actually almost certainly be able to respond to it in time. 
you know, I don't think there's a scenario now where the human race is wiped out by a bug. And it's partly because of this pandemic. It's forced us to learn. So we learn, we figure stuff out. You know, each new technology that we create creates new possibility. So the sense of the adjacent possible for humanity is constantly expanding. And there are wise people exploring that space with their minds, which it gives us at least a shot that we will enter it the right way and not the wrong way. And it's interesting because I, we were with Acumen Academy this morning rereading Plato's Republic, um, where he talks about the difference between the guardians and dogs and how dogs, they have the ability to distinguish between friend and foe, only they know or someone they don't know. Whereas humans have the ability to learn. We have the, we have the ability to gain wisdom. And wisdom seems to be in short degree right now. And so if you were thinking about our education system and what it actually takes to enable these wise people that you're talking about to actually exist and make the right decisions, what are just one or two of the things that you would insist on teaching? I think the, probably the biggest thing that I wish we taught more and that doesn't get taught in most education systems is about us humans, who, who we are, our human nature. We know more about human psychology, human nature now than we ever have. And so I, I wish that people were taught, you know, just at the very most basic level, you're a complicated thing. You have in there an, a lizard brain, for want of a better, better term, that responds viscerally to many things that your more reflective self might not be proud of. You know, the single most important thing you have to do growing up is to figure out how to how to manage your own self, your many selves, your, with the self that you want to be proudest of, your reflective self. Mm. Um, and and there, are, there are strategies to do that that are learnable. And we don't, we don't do that enough. And if, if we did that, if we just accepted that we're imperfect material, but that we can be better, we can learn to manage ourselves and our, you know, all our flaws, that, that I wish we were told, mm. that would make a huge difference. I love that. And then I, I won't turn the whole table on you, I promise. But my last question, in this pandemic, we've been 24-7 together, as have many people who've lived together. And I'm wondering, um, in terms of this recognizing that we're buggy, we're humans, understanding ourselves better, what have you understood better about yourself? I mean, an honest answer to that is I've discovered, and I'm almost embarrassed about it, um, how much I haven't minded it. I've been perfectly happy working from home. Virtual working has, has, has kind of been great. It, you know, it like takes away all those uncomfortable water cooler moments that are supposed to be good and healthy, but <laughs> for an introvert like me are actually uncomfortable. It's meant I got to spend a lot more time with you. You're usually traveling half the year. And uh, this year, not so much. <laughs> but I think we've also learned that in many ways our lives can be simplified. We don't have to travel so much. Some things actually can be done absolutely beautifully on, on Zoom or some other platform. And, and I think some more human aspects of life have, have been dialed up, and I hope we don't lose that. And I think the other thing that's happened from this that, it, that is important is just the realization that science really matters. You know, scientists saw this thing coming. If we'd honestly listened to them more carefully, the problem could have been vastly reduced in scale. We've got climate change coming. It's a much bigger worry than the pandemic. I think, I detect signs that we will take that problem more seriously at this point and join forces to fight, to build a future, a future that we want and that, and that can actually sustain and offer hope to many billions of people. Thanks, so. Chris. Well, and I certainly learned what a great chef you are and appreciate that you were COVID chef um, every night of this <laughs> pandemic. So thank you. And thank you for the, the conversation. <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. That was Jacqueline. 
If you'd like to learn more about her ideas, I do really recommend her latest book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. It amplifies many of the things we spoke about today. Or you could visit acumenacademy.org for all kinds of courses in making social change. I really do wonder what you made of that conversation. If you have any feedback on that or on the show in general, or indeed ideas for future guests, you can just write me directly at tedchris at ted.com. That's T-E-D-C-H-R-I-S at ted.com. The TED Interview is part of the TED Audio Collective, a collection of podcasts dedicated to sparking curiosity and sharing ideas that matter. This show is produced by Kim Nadefane peterson and edited by Grace Rubenstein and Sheila Orfano. Our mixer is Sam Baer, fact check is by Paul Durbin, and special thanks to Michelle Quint, Colin Helms, Nicole Bodie, and Anna Phelan. And thank you to you for listening. See you next time.